Welcome again to the EKU Alumni Spotlight Series. I'm Dan McBride, the Associate Vice President for Alumni Engagement and Development at Eastern Kentucky University, and we have another great show lined up for you tonight. I'm very excited about our guest, and I'll talk more about him in just a few moments. First, I want to give you a preview of some things that are going to be coming up in the next couple of weeks as uh, we continue some of our virtual programming and opportunities for you to see what's going on back on the Campus Beautiful. Coming up next Wednesday, it's another edition of the Colonel's Kitchen, and next week we will be uh, featuring the Kentucky Hot Brown. If you want to learn uh, how to do a Kentucky Hot Brown, it's the uh, program we do with the Applied Human Sciences Department on EKU, and that'll be coming up next Wednesday night at 8 o'clock right here on many of these same channels. Two weeks from tonight, it is another edition of the Alumni Spotlight Series, and we will have Gail Dent, who has had an exciting and fascinating career at the NCAA. We will talk with Gail live from Indianapolis two weeks from tonight. And then coming up in March, I do want to preview on March 9th, we will have Tony Jocelyn as our guest. Tony is an EKU alum who is currently an NFL referee and worked his first NFL playoff game this year. That's coming up on the 9th of March. At 7 p.m., we'll have Tony Jocelyn on. And then coming up later in March, back by popular demand, we'll have another night of EKU Trivia. So be watching for information on some of these upcoming programs. But tonight, it is the Alumni Spotlight Series, and I'm very excited about our guest tonight. That's one of the great things as I get to prepare for these shows. I get to find out more and more about some of our alums and some of the amazing things that we're doing. And I'm really excited that our guest tonight is on during Black History Month because he has had an amazing career has produced uh, over 20 documentary films, and many of those deal with civil rights issues and the African-American experience. He has 35 plus years at WBTV in Charlotte. He's won an Edward R. Murrow Award, several regional Emmy Awards, the National Association for Black Journalists Reporter of the Year Award. He was inducted into the Kentucky Journalism Hall of Fame in October. He won a Salute to Excellence in Television Award, 2019 Post Char Char or excuse me, 2019 Charlotte Post Foundation Educator of the Year, 2013 Charlotte uh, gave him the prestigious MLK Junior Medallion. He is a member of the EKU Hall of Distinguished Alumni. Went in in 2008. He's a broadcaster and filmmaker. You've seen some of his stuff on PBS, some of it on KET. A 1980 graduate of Eastern Kentucky University. And coming to us tonight from Charlotte, North Carolina, let's cross our fingers and hope the connection is working. And welcome to the Alumni Spotlight, Mr. Steve Crump. Steve, good evening and welcome in. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks for having me along. I hope the connection does come up. Uh, there we are. Hey, good to see you. Uh, it's uh, quite a, uh, it's like, who's talking about there in that intro? I do not know him. <laughs> That's a quite a list of accomplishments, and uh, it's been an amazing career, and I know it's been uh, 
Uh, I, I think I read somewhere where um, uh, you referred to it uh, as um, I can't remember your your um, telling the stories was kind of like for you it was kind of like your um, your soothing experience or something for you to get to tell these stories. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very cathartic in many ways. Um, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, you tell the stories that you live and in many of these uh, experiences or narratives or whatever are I can relate to, uh, you know, one being uh, an African-American. I think secondly, uh, you know, the era in which we grew up in and, you know, impacted us uh, even before we got to EKU. Uh, and so, you know, when you put a camera and microphone in uh, somebody's, uh, um, you know, face and space, uh, you know, it's uh, one of those things of where it, it, they become relatable characters and find some empathy and walk in their shoes and vice versa. Pop up a yeah, scene it, somebody from our communications department that uh, when, when friends just says hello. <laughs> so, it was another uh, alum out of our communications department. One of the things that I mean, this is what I was getting at, and I couldn't find my note, but but uh, you have seen these projects as somewhat of a gift, I think, is is what I was looking for. Sure. And I think they are, um, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, being a, an audience, uh, as well as your own personal uh, knowledge based on the experiences that you have, you know, and, and as I like to say, in some regards, it's almost like needles and haystacks when you're approaching these projects. I mean, and uh, I think that's been pretty cool as far as being able to accomplish a lot of things. I mean, even, you know, coming back home to the bluegrass, uh, as I have, uh, you know, in many uh, instances, uh, and, and to find these stories and uh, unearth some of the nuggets that people either didn't necessarily know about or had forgotten about. Um. One of the things, and especially for people who know you, you have uh, have had some health issues over the last couple of years, and I think uh, it's been a, a long journey and a rough journey. But you have certainly learned a lot over the last couple of years. Tell us a little bit about about your health issues over the last couple of years and how you're doing now. Sure, um, you know, I, I, I kind of joke when I say uh, tonight's winning lottery numbers are. 7 21 but it was on July 21st, 2018, that I was uh, diagnosed with uh, colon cancer. And the last two and a half years have been just uh, an amazing uh, journey full of highs and lows. Uh, I think the low part came for me when uh, the short version, I contracted MRSA. I uh, was in the hospital for uh, some 51 days, was attached to a ventilator, dialysis, feeding tube, my right lung had collapsed, and uh, the uh, prognosis of survival at that point in time was uh, very scary. Um, but, uh, you know, there were things that got me through it. Uh, obviously, uh, a faith in God, God's grace and mercy. Um, my amazing wife, Kathy, uh, you saw one of the uh, photos there from when uh, I was in the hospital. Um, and just the uh, network of people that uh, have rallied around me and have inspired me to continue on, to fight on, uh, and not to give up. Um, you know, in fact, we have a uh, surgery uh, scheduled for a week from tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, I just ask for everybody's prayers that uh, we get through it. But uh, compared to where I was uh, to where I am now, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing difference between uh, night and day. And, uh, you know, very grateful for progress. Well, you're looking good and you're sounding good tonight. So that's good. Here's what I like to do when I do these interviews. I like to kind of start after EKU and talk about how you got from leaving EKU to where you are now, 35 plus years in Charlotte. So I know that you had worked a lot while you were a student, but after EKU, you went, I believe, to Lexington and worked and started in the television market there. Is that right? No, <laughs> that is not right. Oh. Uh, but Lexington, I did do some TV work in Lexington. No worries, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the chronology here. I managed to do some TV work uh, in Lexington as a student. Uh, it was even there uh, over WKYT Lexington Channel 27, um, you know, before graduation, uh, thanks to uh, 
a Ken Kurtz who was probably one of the most well-known news directors in that station's reign. And Ken took a chance on me as a college student and uh, allowed me to do some work on air. But you know, my first job in all places uh, was uh, in Savannah, Georgia. I uh, worked at uh, uh, WSAV uh, Television in Savannah, straight out of college. And so from there, I went to uh, Orlando uh, for less than a year. It was not necessarily one of the greatest uh, career moves and experiences. No pun intended. There were some uh, moments where I was Mickey Mouse. But, uh, you know, that regard, uh, came back to Lexington in um, 83 and spent uh, a year and some change at WKYT-TV in Lexington. From there, moved on to Charlotte, uh, to the station where I am now, WBTV. But there was a break in between where I got to spend uh, two and a half years in Detroit at the time. It was the nation's seventh largest market. I call that my experience of uh, trial by fire and going to grad school. But I had a great opportunity. Uh, you will not hear anything, anything uh, on this day that a lot of people remember. Uh, Mary Wilson screams the fact that she passed away. Uh, I kid you not, there would be days that I would be sitting at my desk in the newsroom and Mary Wilson would come walking through because she had a relationship with our uh, entertainment reporter and that kind of, and even being in Detroit uh, for the bad boys years, the Pistons with uh, Isaiah Thomas uh, and uh, Miss Rodman and, and Bill uh, uh was a lot of fun, you know, and uh, returned to Charlotte back in 1989 and haven't looked back, no regrets. Uh, talk a little bit about how you got into filmmaking. And I think you did your first um, documentary in 1994. Is that right? Exactly. You know, the interesting thing, and it's, 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 it's kind of hard when I tell the story that people believe it, but, um, and, you know, you're familiar, Dan, with the communications curriculum that he came back when we were, you know, in the Wallace building and, and the like, and, and and film, not videotape, but film was uh, a part of the actual um, um, uh, study process. Everything from cinema history to uh, editing and editing film and splicing film and getting blue on your clothes and, you know, those kinds of things. And I hated film. I despised it. I was, I was a disc junkie. I was, um, you know, somebody that wanted to be on television. But in terms of one's growth, uh, you know, it was this whole thing of uh, long form reporting. Uh, so, you know, you talk about 94, but what really opened my eyes up was the experience in 1993. I went to Somalia uh, for a couple of weeks during the uh, uh, Operation Restore Hope uh, uh, scenario. And there's a quick little nugget connected to Kentucky and all that. And so you know, we leave uh, out of Charleston, South Carolina, flying on military planes, you know, we stopped in places in Europe, you know, you'd have a day in Germany and a day in Sicily and, you know, you're on these, these crazy orders. So we land in uh, Mombasa, Kenya, and it was the very day that uh, President Clinton was inaugurated. And the reason why I went up and the Kentucky connection there, and so, you know, it's my first time I'd ever, you know, I'd been to Africa, near the equator, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I've, I've never felt heat like that for one thing, um, especially in January, unless it was, a, you know, an, an August day down in Carolina or something like that. And so on Armed Forces Radio Network, uh, you know, we're hearing the proceedings of the Clinton inauguration. Keep in mind, you know, I say it was a theater of the mind. And so there was no TV and, and, and hearing these voices, and there was this voice that came out, and, 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 and I got to share the story with him at the Gold House in Louisville several years later. But I hear two words, and it's like, Mr. Speaker, and it was Wendell Ford. And I, I was wondering the fact that I'm all the way around the world sitting on this hot tarmac in, uh, uh, in, in Mombasa, Kenya, and I'm hearing somebody from, you know, from Owensboro, from down in Davis County, where they make, you know, um, 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 mutton barbecue, and a <laughs> Senator Ford. And several years later, uh, you know, I, I was I was uh, on, a, on a program with uh, Senator Ford and told him that story, which he had me tell to everyone else that was there. But there was, it was almost a voice as familiar as a K with Ledford in that regard. But Senator Ford says to me, he says, young man, all you were hearing was a bunch of, old cigarettes, a lot of old, 
hopefully it was Kentucky bourbon he was talking about. <laughs> uh, now, you have made several trips to, to Africa in your career. Kind of tell us about, I know you also, uh, you did, I believe, some, some reporting on apartheid and were in South Africa. Tell us a little bit about some of your travels. Well, you know, the apartheid in South Africa, and I'm going to be very uh, shameless uh, in um, uh, my promotion uh, for my uh, high school. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, as much as I'm a colonel, I'm a, I'm a Trinity Shamrock from, from Louisville. I'll never deny that. And in 1974, there was a third world studies course taught by uh, Pete Flagg, who was the uh, uh, late uh, principal president of Trinity. And we're learning, um, you know, about apartheid in South Africa. It was long before we ever heard the names Desmond Tutu or Nelson Mandela. Uh, and, you know, quite obviously in terms of what it was we had gone through in this country and in many instances in the Jim Crow South, you know, apartheid in 1974 was at its peak. And by the numbers, when you look at the way things were structured in South Africa, you had a population of 20 million. 16 million blacks being controlled by 4 million whites. And I knew that in 1974, I was thinking, gosh, I got to get there one day. And it was long before, you know, I ended up becoming a journalist. I, you know, when I got to EKU, and we'll talk about this later, I was a political science major. But the fact of the matter is, you know, I went there in, nine, in 94, the year after going to Somalia. Uh, and um, we did this whole piece uh, focusing on uh, connections uh, from uh, North and South Carolina, uh, everything in education to uh, manufacturing. Uh, and, uh, you know, following year, we were uh, uh, blessed to win uh, our first Emmy as a result of that. Project. When you, ha this is a question I always want to ask of filmmakers. Where, where do you come up with an idea? How does a story grab you and say, this is something that I want to dig into and, and something I want to tell the story more about? You know, for, for me, I, I, I have an interesting theory. I always say sometimes you pick the project and sometimes the project picks you. And, you know, uh, perhaps at the end of the day, they're, uh, they're social uh, redeeming value. Uh, I'll use this as an example. Um, you know, we did this project that uh, ran on uh, Kentucky Educational Television called uh, Forgotten at the Finish Line. And the amazing thing, you know, um, uh, with that, as you look at... Uh, uh, and, 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 and keep in mind, you know, for those of us who uh, proudly hail from the Bluegrass State, you know, horse racing is in our DNA. Uh, and when you look at some of the early years that come from African Americans, horse racing, uh, Rochelle Riley, who's a dear friend, former columnist with the uh, Courier Journal and is Free Press, and we had interviewed her for this project. And Rochelle, um, and, and you know, again, you, with the uh, statistics in the very first, uh, um, you know, Kentucky uh, Derby was won by a black man, Oliver Lewis. Uh, and you look at some of the people, such as Isaac Murphy, that you know, um, the person to uh, win three Kentucky Derbies long before there was an Eddie Arcaro. Um, you know, you had Dickfield who uh, won back to back. Whitfield from uh, not far from Richmond down in Childsburg on the other side. And as you string these stories together, uh, as far as their triumphs as well as some of the hardships, I mean, I think that there are some things that people, as I go back to something I said earlier, they didn't necessarily know, but there's also a level of, uh, of, of education as well as, uh, as I speak of the redemption value that people are able to find and walk away with those pieces inspired, informed, and perhaps enlightened. Uh, let's talk a little bit. Um, you mentioned horse racing. I know that's one of your personal passions. Um, you grew up in Louisville. How did you end up at EKU growing up in Louisville? What was it that brought you to Richmond and to EKU? <laughs> You know, it's, it's really, and you know, I have to go back to the senior year of high school and a weekend that I spent at EKU. It was an Earth, Wind, and Fire concert in 1975. It was the spring of 1975. And uh, one of the guys that grew up in my neighborhood um, uh, that I take pride in back home in Louisville in Smoketown, a guy by the name of Jerry Jackson, 
invites me down. And I'd done a seminar at EKE several years before, but I, I remember my first, um, uh, right before, um, you know, uh, coming to EKU uh, and the weekend of that concert, staying in Keene Hall, better known as Keene Island. <laughs> Not for some of those cold days, you'd have to walk from Keene all the way over, you know, towards the Wallace Building or the Combs Building or the Jones Building or whatever. And it was uh, my exposure to uh, that case as a result of uh, the concert that we did that uh, provided, um, you know, a certain amount of perspective. And uh, you're not in trouble, are you? You hear a siren. <laughs> Rich and no, siren. Yeah, no. I, I'm no, just in the blank right house right on Lancaster. So. Oh, I know exactly where you are, <laughs> but uh, but in any event, it was it was it was the exposure to some of the culture at, at Eastern. I got to uh, uh, see what was happening, you know, as far as some of the uh, African American uh, fraternities and sororities. I was there for several days, uh, kind of as part of my spring break there. It was close enough to home to where my parents weren't exactly fearful. It was affordable enough, and so uh, you know, it it seemed like a good fit. It seemed like a really good fit. Now, you mentioned Earth, Wind & Fire. You did get to interview them, if I'm not mistaken, at the Kennedy Center not long ago, right? That's true, that's true. Uh, we were doing a piece uh, here in Charlotte. There was a lady uh, by the name of uh, Patricia McBride, who was a, uh, a prima ballerina who was from Charlotte. And I talked to our folks and to, uh, said, hey guys, uh, let's, you know, we're a CBS station, CBS carries the Kennedy Honors, and so, um, um, you know, it, it was one of those things of where, um, you know, I said, hey, let, you know, let, let, let's go to DC and do this piece. They did on it and I said, sure. So we're on the red carpet that night and, you know, and, 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 and you're like a kid in a candy store. I mean, you know, you're there, you're credentialed, you got your tux on and, you know, the whole bed and, you know, it's the red carpet and all the frappings and, you know, and everybody's there. It's kind of a gap, if you will, for us. And so uh, that night I had to interview Sting and Tom Hanks and uh, Al Green was part of the procession and uh, apparently uh, Herbie Hancock. And here comes Earth, Wind and Fire. It was Verdine White, Ralph Johnson and Philip Bailey. And uh, you know, uh, you know we, we chitty chatted for a little bit. I have a nice picture. And he even talked about one of the original guitars. So this is a bit of a trivia moment. But, one of the original uh, guitars uh, of Earth, Wind, and Fire is from Louisville, uh, John, who uh, went to school at Kentucky State University, and we got to talk about Johnny for a second. So, um, yeah, that was that was that was quite a moment. Yeah, I'm a big Earth, Wind, and Fire fan, so so that jumped out at me when I was doing my research. Uh, now, you mentioned earlier, and this is interesting. You weren't a broadcasting major at first when you came to EKU. I know that political science, I think, is is what you originally came thinking you were going to study at EKU. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I was a poli-sci major um, with aspirations of going to law school. I always tell people uh, one of my life's uh, feelings is never taking the LSAT. But, you know, the reality of that is, um, you know, I tell people all the time, uh, you know, my uh, transcript reads like a bad credit report. You know, to borrow a line, and I'm, um, you know, my, my 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 good friend was for uh, ABC Nightline, Byron Pitts, uh, who I've known for many years. And Byron uh, has this thing. He says, "Hey, I didn't graduate uh, cum laude. I graduated thank you laude." And so for <laughs> me, that's uh, kind of the um, analogy that I use as far as getting through my five years of uh, undergrad with a degree at EKU, where you know, uh, four of the five years, um, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I was academic probation. I, I, I had great folks, you know, they had a learning plan. And some of the people I've managed to stay in touch with who are retired from Eastern, who were very uh, helpful uh, with me getting getting through school, uh, people such as uh, uh, Terry Cole Ross and, and Gwen Gray, uh, uh, Eloise Warming and Jim Libby were there. Uh, uh, Ann Alger uh, headed it up and it was kind of a, nice little safety net. In fact, you know, you talk about African-American life on campus. I didn't even have the grades to uh, pledge a, a black fraternity. And I'm, that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that the transition came around, it was like, got to go, can't do it. <laughs> we'll see the shows on stage, not going to happen. Uh, 
You, one of the things that I love hearing this from students, but one of the things that you really benefited and you referred to this a little bit earlier too, is you were able to work while you were a student and gain some hands-on valuable experience. And I know you worked at WEKU FM on campus and also at WEKY, uh, one of the local radio stations while you were a student. Yeah, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, give a shout out or, or, or props to uh, somebody uh, uh, still uh, in the game, as I like to say, back home and still on air. And that would be uh, uh, Lawrence, a.k.a. Larry Smith, who's at uh, WDRB. In fact, uh, 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 Lawrence just scored a pretty big interview a few weeks ago with uh, Attorney General Dam Daniel Cameron uh, in the wake of the Breonna Taylor uh, situation back home. And I remember I was uh, over in Keene Hall. I hadn't moved there. I lived in Keene my junior year. But um, Larry, it was one of those things we knew each other. And he, said, he says, hey, man, I'm heading over to the college radio station uh, to make some uh, Christmas saves for my family. You want to come with me? So we went over to the Donovan building. And, you know, I always had an interest in this business. I mean, I remember uh, as a you know, high school student, uh, you know, and you talk about some of the various influences that you have, uh, you know, where Louisville was the big market and, you know, you could go and sit in the lobby of uh, Wacky Radio, WAKY, -K the big 79, and, you know, sit and watch the uh, jocks work and the whole bit. And that was, uh, you know, uh, quite an experience where, you know, I had always wanted the opportunity. And so I'm walking to the control room and, you know, the station was off the air. So Larry was in there overnight. Lawrence was in there overnight, uh, you know, uh, doing tape dubs and the whole bit and, you know, showing me how to run the board and that sort of thing. And and that was my epiphany moment. And so that very next semester, I switched majors. And uh, there we are. Um, that one, that's the old control room at WEKUFM where I'm wearing the headphones. Uh, he had a RCA uh, DX77 uh, microphone. If you can find one today, they're about three thousand dollars. But um, but the thing is, that was that room right there is where it began. And I remember, you know, it was 1960. We were. This is before um, uh, you, you play long, you know, uh, hour long tape, whatever. Um, you know, from the standpoint of where you would only get to like talk one time, it would be the, you know, the station ID. And, you know, the line was, quote, you're listening to the stereo voice of Eastern Kentucky University, 88.9 WEKUFM Richmond. And that kept everything legal, but that was that was it. That was the exposure. And that was how, you know, in some regards, you got to fly the plane. So uh, that's kind of, kind, of, kind of where the story happened. But obviously, you got to work at WEKY, and a little bit different there. You got a chance to DJ when you were at EKY. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I had two runs to EKY, and what what happened after leaving EKUFM? Uh, the summer of '77, there was an African American station owner who I have a great debt of gratitude uh, uh, for and towards. His name is uh, William E. Summers III. Uh, and uh, uh, Bill Summers, uh, who is a member of the Kentucky Journalism Hall of Fame, owned uh, WLOU, which is an RB station, and had an FM station uh, for a short while, WSTM FM, which was disco and jazz. And so, as a 19 year old, I was doing uh, the overnights uh, for them. It was my summer job. And so, um, as a result of that, I had, you know, uh, a pretty good reel, you know, some, some, some fairly decent air checks. And, you know, I come back to school and was looking for work and put me on the air. It's just here right there, W-E-K-Y, the, uh, you know, thir 1340 a.m. You, know, uh, you know, we had all kinds of crazy slogans. I remember your, your music is W-E-K-Y. Well, that's one thing we have in common. I spent some time at W-E-K-Y, and I think I still have a, a pin, a big pin that has that same W-E-K-Y logo on it. Uh, somewhere in my archives. Um, now, you also did some TV work on campus, and, and we have a, a clip from that I want to show in a minute, but talk a little bit about the program that you did on campus that was uh, some video work. Yeah, that was, that, was, that was pretty interesting. There would be a weekly uh, newscast that we would do, uh, and it was called a Campus Weekly Review. 
And we kind of had the rotating anchors. Um, you know, what was interesting is the fact that uh, uh, you ended up, uh, you know, taking turns, if you will. And a lot of the people that were on the radio side made the transition uh, to the television side. So I got to anchor the campus news maybe, you know, once or twice a month. The thing that was really um, um, uh, kind of funny was that only there were there were two cameras, and um, I got I got a note. Uh, you talk about people who had vision and were associated with the campus, still associated with the campus, being uh, uh, Fred Koloff, uh, who was the director of the uh, radio and TV division. But the amazing thing about this studio, and I've never seen anything quite like it, only one camera had a teleprompter. So when you're scripting a show, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, who's going to read off the prompter camera? You know, rather than having to look down, look uh, look down, look up. yeah. So let's. So uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Let's see if we can. Uh, and I don't know, Alex. Hopefully, our guys running the controls backstage. Can we take a look at that clip? Let's see what we've got. <laughs> Good evening. The University Board of Regents will have a full bill of morning. <laughs> a vastly revised open house policy. Oh my goodness! On student affairs last week. I love the hair. I love the hair. Women's and women's entered Oh man, I, I call that my Mac. Robinson, Robinson look without the mustache. Look on Friday and Saturdays. <laughs> my wife says I still own that tie. <laughs> <laughs> to 6 p.m. with at least three additional hours of open house. All right, I feel like I feel like anybody in the Wayback Machine on this one, you know? If a student legal advisor, I love it. But it, yeah, it, that was in the uh, association. The board may also be asked to consider hikes and room costs. For what we didn't yeah, show, and, 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 and you look at the chroma key on the top of the row. I don't even have. I don't even own own a hair lock yeah, it anymore. Might be very drastic. The students what we didn't see was the intro and some of the uh, the footage from around campus from, from yeah, that era. Right. Yeah, it's just classic. After he found um, out he joined a campus fraternity. So was this some of your first on-air work? He didn't join the fraternities, but rather the problem came up. It was some of my first TV work. Uh, you know, we're talking circa 1977. So uh, that uh, was, uh, yeah, you know, pretty, 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 pretty wild. Look! Look at the microphone, like wear it like, like a referee's whistle. You know? So, <laughs> the Martin Hall Grill be open for a twenty-four hour study area. Pretty interesting. The council is pretty yeah. interesting. Now on its way to. I loved hearing too uh, some of the issues. But it was, that, uh, you know, fun time on campus. When the bill is to be out of committee is unknown. When we come back, we'll take a look at a one part. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We not be celebrating but, when we find. You out know, it was um, a chance to write and produce at a very young age. In fact, uh, Libby Frost, uh, who uh, was in the communication department at EKU, lives here um, in, in the Carolinas, and I get to speak to her periodically. She just chimed in a moment ago. Uh, and, you know, she was uh, on faculty in the Wallace Building uh, working with the EKU Progress when all this was going on. So we had just uh, quite a springboard of uh, opportunities. We do have a few questions, and I want to make sure we get to those because some of the viewers uh, have uh, have put them in, sure. and I want to make sure we pass those on. First up, Dale Morgan wants to know, what were some of your most difficult obstacles that you had to face as you progressed in your journalism career? Um, good question. You know, one of the things I will say about uh, journalism uh, – and it's probably the same thing that you would say about uh, others. No two days are ever alike. I mean, uh, you know, I, um, you know, there there have been days that I've interviewed uh, millionaires and people on Skid Row in the same afternoon. Uh, and I think having the ability to um, make people feel at ease when you talk to them, uh, to uh, uh, try to win their trust. Uh, to uh, demonstrate a uh, level of, uh, you know, integrity, uh, you know, and, and in many respects, um, you know, there are some difficulties there. I mean, especially right now when, you know, you hear the words fake news. I mean, you know, come on, give it, you know, give it, give it, give it a break. I mean, from the standpoint of where you're in a business that uh, prides itself on telling the truth, 
And you know, quite obviously, uh, and, you know, you go back to where I was, say, at EKU in the 70s, TV news was still being, it was maybe, what, 20, 25 years old. Uh, the craft was still being invented. So, you know, in that vein, in that regard, I think that there's a certain level of seriousness and, and responsibility that uh, comes along with uh, the profession itself, and especially as the profession evolves more so into what we're doing right now on, on social media platforms. Uh, next up, we have Steve Greenwell, who asked this question. I would love to know what was the most rewarding professional experience you have had thus far? You know, there, 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 there have been so many. Um, you know, you think about the places you've been, the people you've met, um, you know, folks you've interviewed and the like. One question that people said to me, I got, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, interviewing Earth, Wind, and Fire earlier uh, back, uh, I think it was 1992. Uh, as the saying goes, I got damn lucky and uh, pulled off uh, a one-on-one -on -one exclusive with Paul McCartney. Right place, right time. He knew where he was going to be in the whole bit. You know, and people are like, oh, that's 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 the biggest get you've gotten. And, and, and you know, uh, and the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, he's famous. He's known around the world, blah, 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 blah. But to me, it wasn't. And that is, I was telling you about uh, being, you know, Trinity Shamrock, which means that, you know, Catholic, which goes back to a KET project. And for me, it was uh, the interview that I scored with Mother Teresa. Uh, I will always remember that, you know. I mean, how many people can say that they held the hand of somebody that was canonized and became a saint to borrow a line from Mass, you know, to grab to the line, it's just like, do this in memory of me. I was really surprised with that. So, you know, there have been a lot of rewarding moments, per se, uh, but I think that you have to also realize the um, um, you know, responsibility that you have. I mean, um, I, can, I can think of, um, you know, going to a crime scene and uh, some things are uncertain and, and you have a, uh, have a grieving mother coming up saying, Mr. Crump, is my, is my son alive or dead? Or, you know, yes, uh, I know. can they save my And to borrow a line from, uh, you know, Dan Rather in some regards, uh, you know, on, on, on many days we try to be even-handed brokers of information. So to me, that takes any spin or any uh, predisposed position totally out of the mix. Uh, the next question we have is from Rhonda G. Churchill, and she says, are you working on any storyline right now? We got a few things. <laughs> um, we got a few things that are that are that are uh, uh, in in the hopper. Um, um, uh, stay tuned. I think that we may have another project, too, for uh, uh, Kentucky Educational Television, you know, uh, between now and the end of the year. So uh, uh, we might even have something, uh, depending on the last edit session goes, that may come out uh, uh, Black History Month. So you guys can find me on Facebook, um, you know, or Twitter. My uh, handle is Crump Dude on Twitter or on Instagram. So, you know, stay tuned. Uh, we will uh, keep you guys in the loop for sure. Well, and that's one of the things uh, that I would like to encourage the people who are watching tonight. Steve's career has so many different facets to it and so many different uh, things you've done, um, you know, forgotten at the finish line, the Muhammad Ali piece that you did. There are so many different things that we can't cover them all in an hour. So I want to encourage people to look you up, look at some of your stuff, find your work and follow it. Um, because there's a lot out there. Yeah. Yeah. You saw the picture with Ken Burns. That's our anchor, Jamie Bowl, who, uh, uh, we uh, did a whole uh, sit-in project a year or so ago, and you know, you talk about uh, other interviews. And as, even though I mentioned uh, Mother Teresa, uh, I had the opportunity, and uh, even uh, last year we completed a whole documentary on him uh, before he died. You know, it was on uh, You know, Ken Burns is an amazing uh, storyteller. Uh, in fact, he has a project that I thought would be out by now on Muhammad Ali just contacted me several months ago, but they were working on uh, an eight-part uh, documentary on the time 
um, you know, uh, at uh, um, WHAS in Louisville getting a lot of their, their film archives. And I want to just speak up about that station itself because that was where I probably did one of the most of internships that I'd ever had. And, you know, I mentioned Kay with Ledford earlier, but I think the um, other thing is to be in such an environment at the time, that, you know, the number one station in the largest market uh, in the state and, you know, work around. And again, it was, uh, I, I would call it a golden era uh, for television news where you had a, a Jim Mitchell and a Kirstie Wilde to you know, my, um, my, as I call my, my great white father who uh, has, you know, who is the voice of God, Van Vance, uh, who did the uh, University of Louisville play-by-play in the Kentucky Colonels for years. Uh, and, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, just to be that, that um, um, uh, connected and, and, and the person who uh, was my main mentor, uh, one of the best uh, African American journalists I've ever worked with in my life and ever will work with, the, uh, the late Chuck Olmstead. Uh, people say, Steve, you've lost your hair and you have the Chuck Olmstead beard now. So, you know, in that regard, I'll offer that as a compliment. Uh, he's, uh, you know, uh, Chuck was the man, and, and it, 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 those people that, you know, I just, uh, there's a debt of gratitude that will uh, uh, be unpaid. And, you know, the other thing, too, at Eastern, uh, you'll find that if you remember this in some of the dorms, the way the cable system was um, set up, we had, were able to get newscasts different. So we had uh, basically, um, you know, Louisville, Lexington, and Cincinnati which gave me a little bit of a market. And you're talking about Africa. The last time I went to Africa was 10 years ago, and we had done this project in Sudan. And you would never guess, speaking of a Kentucky connection, who I got to do the intro to the documentary for me. And that would be Nick Clooney. Oh, yeah. Who's that? Yeah, Kentucky who's, native. Who, who's from Maysville, Kentucky? Yeah. Kentucky native, yeah, right up, right along the banks of the Ohio River. And, uh, you know, uh, Clooney was just such a, a fixture in television. And the way all that came about, he was doing a teaching fellowship at American University. And, and four days before the program, I get a phone call from Nina Clooney, George's mom, who happens to be from down in Baldwin County, down in Parallel, <laughs> on the other side of Danville. And, um, you know, they said, hey, we saw your rough cut. We like it. Uh, Nick I had to intro for your show. So we literally dropped everything we were doing. I get to DC the next day and uh, knocks it out on one take. And I mean, it was, uh, you know, that that kind of luck. You know, so it was, uh, uh, but getting back to what I was saying, the fact that you had so many different entities that we were exposed to as students at EKU, uh, you could, you could people that you wanted to be like, uh, you could see different of storytelling, you know, based on the three biggest markets in that region. And, you know, some of us were lucky enough to get jobs coming out of school um, in, the, in, in those markets, in those environments. Yeah. Well, I remember Nick Clooney being on the air in the Cincinnati market when I was younger and being able to watch him. Uh, we've got a comment here from Jonathan Figs, and he says he wants you to tell him about your Eclipse Award. Jonathan Figs from Lexington, Kentucky. Jonathan is a great guy. He has worked in the horse racing industry for many years. Uh, his brother, uh, Charles, and I were freshmen together. Charles has been a great cameraman at stations in Ohio and uh, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And in 2001, um, you know, you talk about a blessing. Uh, the documentary, and if you go on YouTube, you can find it. It's called Forgotten at the Finish Line. And that piece won an Eclipse Award. And I'm not trying to brag or blow my own horn on that, but uh, I'm the only uh, African-American journalist to win you know, an Eclipse Award outright you know, by myself is not you know, having to share it with anybody. It sounds like I'm greedy, but you know, the fact of the matter is uh, we did that piece. That goes back to uh, uh, the stuff that we had done on Jimmy Winkfield and Isaac Murphy. Uh, and some of the uh, other elements from uh, Keeneland. We spent a lot of time at the library in Keeneland and up at the Kentucky Horse Park near Lexington. Uh, and uh, it's good to see that Figs is still uh, in the business. I enjoy his, his, his handicapping notes that he puts on Facebook. 
All right. There's a couple of things that I have in my notes that I have to ask you about. Uh, one of them is sure. Crump, Crump Daddy. They tell me that they've given you that nickname. <laughs> yeah, sure. Crump Daddy. Tell me about that. That means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> that's the short version of it. He's, he's been around while the time began. No, that's... Uh, I think, I think I think it's a term of endearment that uh, some of the people have uh, found in our newsroom, and uh, uh, some people call me Crumpy, Crump Daddy, whatever. You know, rarely am I called Steve, you know. So it's just uh, one, of, one of you know one of, one of the sounds like you're getting ready to go through uh, um, a segment here that you would probably call Stump the Crump. <laughs> Uh, another thing that I found out about you, which we have this in common, my friends make fun of me because I have Hulu, and one of my saved shows on Hulu is The Rockford Files. I love The Rockford Files, and I understand you are a Rockford Files fan also. Oh boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just don't know uh, uh, the scripts in, uh, you know, um, uh, you know in Bible and verse, but... Uh, you know, Rockford Files trivia, um, you know, let's see, the tag number on Jimmy's uh, gold firebird, uh, uh, 853 Ocean King George. Wow. So yeah, wow. I can tell you. Yeah, so you definitely know more about the Rockford Files than I do. Uh, you know, when you look back at all the different documentaries and, and pieces that you've done. Is there a favorite that you have or is there one that, that kind of stands out for any particular reason in your mind? You know, to me, it's, um, and I know this is kind of a, kind of, kind of a weird analogy to use, but they're, they're, they're like children. Um, they um, have um, uh, personalities all their own. Um, you know, and something I said earlier uh, in, in referencing, uh, you know, the work and the like, you know, no two are, 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 are ever alike. I mean, doing uh, a piece overseas where, for an example, I've done a 30 minute project uh, in Bosnia, uh, you know, I mean, doing a piece in Bosnia, it's different than doing a piece in South Africa. Uh, yeah. You know, doing something on civil rights, uh, you know, in South Carolina, you know, is way different than focusing on an individual like Muhammad Ali here, you know? So, you know, they take it to their own. Uh, there are, um, you know, interviews you do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a research fiend in that regard. And uh, I, I think I think one of the ways that I try to cut through uh, uh, the chase on a lot of it Cut to the chase on a lot of it is uh, it's, it's it's like finding finding needles in a haystack. You know how many needles can I, can I unearth? How many uh, elements to a story can I pull out that someone doesn't know about? Uh, you know what? And 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 I also think too, uh, what's the value uh, in a community? You know, um, I mean, I can think of uh, and and not to say. You know, there have been a number of uh, pieces I've done, for an example, interviewing some of the uh, original Tuskegee Airmen who aren't here to share their stories. And um, you know, I mentioned John Lewis earlier, you know, from the same point of where I've been able, I was able to sit down with him on, on several occasions. Um, one of the uh, great blessings of this uh, journey, because I guess that's what it is, um, the uh, projects that we've done, uh, Next week, we will uh, unveil it and uh, find me on Facebook. I'll put the link up. Um, and there's Congressman John Lewis and wife Kathy and I that was uh, in uh, Charleston at the uh, Gibbs Museum. Um, and uh, but uh, we're our, our, our collection uh, and uh, donated to the University of South Carolina uh, for civil rights and African American studies. And it is the Steve and Pete Wilson Crump Civil Rights Collection. Uh, and Kathy, who's on the right there, uh, is a graduate of the University of South Carolina, along with uh, three of her siblings, uh, uh, including uh, our nephew, Chris. And it was kind of cool being there for Chris's commencement because the keynote speaker was uh, a guy I've interviewed a few times, Darius Rucker of uh, Hootie and the Blowfish fame, and, you know, has done a lot of stuff uh, in music. So 
um, you know, uh, USC gets the uh, uh, the programs and the raw interviews and uh, uh, a lot of the uh, materials that we use to put this project together. But you know, whatever EKU wants, they can have. Not a problem. Great. Well, as we're kind of coming to the end here, Steve, I, I just want to let you, as you look back on your time at EKU and and your time in Richmond. Uh, just talk about kind of what that meant to you and kind of setting you up for what was later a 40 plus year career in journalism and broadcasting. Well, well, well there are several things, um, you know, and, and, and that is and, uh, Figs does just a great job in keeping everybody uh, informed because every two years there is a uh, African-American uh, student reunion at EKU. Uh, one of the people, Dan, I know that you're very aware of, it, you've worked, worked alongside with over the years, has been uh, Donna Kenny. I knew her when she was Donna Black, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who's you know retired from EKU. And um, you know, and so you know, we get together every two years and swap war stories, and um, you know, um, um, just kind of a nice reference point to have. The reason why I bring that up, and I'm going to answer your question about the journalism part of it. You know, having lived primarily in the South where you have a strong sense of uh, historical biases, and I've had the opportunity to do work at places like Morehouse and Spelman and uh, uh, Howard were our um, uh, vice presidents from uh, Hampton, Virginia and the like. And, you know, there have been times of, uh, gosh, you know, I really missed out on such an amazing experience by not attending an HBCU. My mother uh, attended Kentucky State over in Frankfurt, spent her last year of school in Howard. But coming back to the very first uh, African-American student reunion, there was just this sense of togetherness where you have, um, you know, I guess a population of EKE, 14,000 students. And out of that, um, you know, you have 800 black students, which is, you know, uh, you know not, even, not even 10 percent, a very small fraction, which meant for each other, we had to be there for each other. Uh, we had to have our own sense of community, and that was carried out through um, uh, the Greek organizations. I'm so moved when I hear about what the Divine Nine, what they're trying to do with building uh, on the EKU campus. Uh, and, and uh, you know, in the uh, uh, situation where I was working full time, I might add, at WEKY, while in Maddox Hall, which I understand is still standing, even though we've torn down Todd and Dupree. Um, there was an interaction that I had with the Richmond community where, you know, everybody from um, uh, uh, Bob Lai to uh, Robert uh, Goodlow up at First Baptist up on the hill to, uh, uh, you know, uh, Joe Bodie who owned the Magic Moment, you know, which was our student gathering place. Uh, uh, Stan Miller, I was, I was home a few years ago and went through Richmond and um, in any event, um, um, it was one of those things where, you know, Stan used to cut a lot of the, you know, the students' hair and, and you know, and, 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 and had those war stories. So there was a great deal of there, you know, yeah, it was the campus life, but because I was, you know, kind of uh, involved with the uh, public on a day-to-day -day basis, I got to learn the community. And in some regards, too, my experience, uh, you know, as an African-American, it was a series of firsts. My first... Um, uh, we had an African American homecoming, the first time ever. And dad and me, and when I graduated, uh, there was an African American student body for us in a Clayborn trial. So, you know, you, you can see that there are some rather uh, amazing reference points, uh, you know, uh, that, that have you. Well, it's been an amazing career, and I could talk to you all night about. Lots of different things, but we do have to finish up. And uh, I appreciate your time tonight, Steve. It's been great talking to you. And again, I encourage everyone watching um, to look you up on Facebook, to go to YouTube and look for some of your stuff because uh, it's just an incredible body of work over these 35 plus years. We're so happy to see that you're doing better with your health and uh, um, we'd love to have you back you. on maybe next year. We can talk more. Yeah, yeah, you know, and 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 I, and I guess on a closing note, uh, for me, it's been quite a thrill from the standpoint of my horse racing earlier. Um, our sister station, uh, WADE Wave Three in Louisville, they've 
managed to bring me back home to cover the Derby over the last few years. That's just an amazing thrill, you know, not only from sharing one's knowledge uh, regarding horse racing, but, you know, to be in the environment with friends and family and you're able to, uh, um, you know, showcase, um, you know, um, uh, you know, your, your talent. Uh, uh, just being in that environment, a lot of things that, uh, you know, employ your value system uh, still, you know, happens to have a lot of, a lot, a lot of merit. Well, thank you so much for being with you with us. And uh, we're getting ice tomorrow. So hopefully you're going to have better weather in North Carolina than what we've got up here. So have a great night and a great week. Hey, Steve. If you're going to get it. Well, hey, hey, but on a close note, if you're going to get some ice and snow, it, it could be kind of cool because somebody like run steel trades from the cafeteria and go to the, the ravine and go down the hill. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> so that was always kind of the, uh, the icy, snowy weather scenario. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we, we may have a, a day to do that race. tomorrow. Steve, thanks so much for All being right. with us. Dan, thank you. appreciate it. I, I enjoyed it. Great. All right. Steve Crump, our guest tonight, and 35-plus uh, years at WBTV in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, over 20 different documentary films, uh, another one of the many outstanding alums we have here at Eastern Kentucky University. Thanks so much to Steve for being with us tonight. Quick reminder again about some things coming up. Again, next Wednesday, it's the next edition of the Colonel's Kitchen. That will be at eight o'clock next Wednesday. And uh, we'll be making a Kentucky hot brown and maybe even a little Valentine treat as well. Coming up two weeks from tonight, we will continue uh, Black History Month. We have Gail Dent, who is at the NCAA in Indianapolis and has been there for many years. We'll talk with Gail about her distinguished career. And then coming up on March 9th, on uh, our first Tuesday in March, or the second Tuesday in March, we will have Tony Jocelyn, who is an NFL referee and an EKU alum. He'll be on the Alumni Spotlight Series with us on the 9th of March. That will wrap things up for us tonight. Again, my thanks to Steve Greenwell and Alex Hannivan behind the scenes, making everything work. A special thanks to Steve Crump, our special guest tonight, and a thanks to you for tuning in and watching us here on the Alumni Spotlight Series. Good night.